Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 122, Seven Christians on Four Questions in the Same God Controversy. You may have noticed that the Trinity's podcast doesn't exactly have a standard format. I do different kinds of shows. I do interviews, I do historical episodes, biblically based episodes. There is a strategy here. The strategy is to trust the intelligence of the listeners to find important things interesting. So this one's going to be a little different, I think, than any other episode. This hopefully will be the last podcast in a while on this Wheaton College controversy from December of 2015 and January of 2016. I know this isn't the Christianity and Islam podcast, and there are a lot of other topics that we want to get back to. But I think there's a lot of unclarity in the commentary and discussions surrounding this debate, and I want to do my part to try to bring some philosophical distinctions into the mix to be helpful to people. I want to distinguish between four different questions. The first question is, is what I call naive pluralism true. Religious pluralism is the doctrine that all religions or all major religions, all religions in some group are in some way equal. There are many different theories of religious pluralism, and if you want to learn about some of those, I'll put a link on this blog post to my article in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy called Theories of Religious Diversity, and versions of pluralism are one approach to religious diversity. One form of what I call naive pluralism says that there are no important differences between Christianity and Islam. Now, almost nobody says yes to this question. Is naive pluralism true in that sense? There are only two kinds of people who say yes to it. There are people who are just pig ignorant of the differences between the religions who might say that. They just don't know about the differences. Or there are people that have really extreme views about what counts as an important difference. So they might think that the purpose of religion is just to, you know, help you be a relatively upstanding citizen, not murder anybody, pay your taxes, be nice to your children and your wife. And they might think that the religions are all equal in that respect, that they help a person to do that. Well, whether or not that's so, that all religions equally help a person to do that, it's an extreme view that that's all that matters about religion is this practical help that it's supposed to give. Most people think that it matters whether or not a religion's teachings are true. And once you grant that, then there are definitely going to be important differences between Christianity and Islam. The second question is the reference question, and this is the one that we focused on in the last couple episodes of the Trinity's podcast. The question is, are Christians and Muslims referring to the same being? When Christians say God, and when Muslims in their context say Allah, Are those two terms co-referential? A third question is the worship question. Do Christians and Muslims successfully worship this being? And as I discussed in the last Trinity's podcast with my friend Dr. William Valicella, I think there's an ambiguity in the word worship. If worship is just something we do, then it's not that controversial to say that Christians and Muslims worship the same being. That is, we both adopt a mental posture of worship towards the same being, aimed in the same direction, so to speak. But if worship means a two-way interaction between people and God, not only are honor, praise, and thanks offered to God, but God also receives them and responds in some way, then it would be more controversial to say that Christians and Muslims worship the same being. The fourth question is the salvation question, and it's this. Do all people in religions which officially reject the message of Jesus go to hell? As we'll hear in a bit, some people think that the Bible just straightforwardly says this. But there are also long and wide and deep traditions in Christian theology of saying, no, not quite. There could be people in some of these other religions which officially reject the gospel of Jesus, which nonetheless don't go to hell. We'll talk about that in a bit. So the controversy was started by this Wheaton College, and that's the Wheaton College in Illinois, by the way, not the one in Massachusetts. It was started by this political science professor there named Dr. Larisha Hawkins. 
and I've done numerous blog posts on this on Trinities in December and January. And to make a long story short, her answers to these questions are no, yes, yes, and no comment. So just to go through those, she is explicitly denying naive pluralism, or really seemingly any kind of pluralism. Certainly nothing she says even suggests pluralism. That, I think, is important, and I think some commenters are ignoring that. And a lot of the fury that's directed against her, I think, is based on people thinking that she's pushing some kind of pluralism. To the reference question, she is saying, yes, Christians and Muslims are talking about the same one. They are directing their prayers and directing their worship towards God. Do they worship the same being? Well, in the first sense of worship, where worship is just something that we do, then she is saying yes to that, because we're referring to the same God and we're attempting to properly honor that God. So insofar as worship is just something that we do, she's saying Christians and Muslims do worship the same being, the same God. She's not taking a position about whether Muslims are successfully achieving worship in the second sense that I just explained. So she's not taking a stand about to what extent God accepts Islamic worship. She just isn't saying anything about that. She also isn't saying anything about the question of do all people and religions which officially reject the message of Jesus go to hell? She just hasn't said anything about that. She hasn't said that you can be saved through Islam. She hasn't said that nobody is saved through the practice and belief of Islam. Those are thorny theological issues that probably most political science professors don't want to get into. My own answers are no way, yes, yes, in the first sense of worship. And if we're talking about the second sense of worship, I think it's a bad question. And to the last, I would say no. I think naive pluralism is just obviously false. I think there's a compelling case for answering yes to the reference question. I gave my little argument for that in the previous podcast. As far as worship, again, if worship is just something that we do, aiming our honor, thanks, and praise towards God, yes, I do think Muslims are doing that. Now, does God accept all Christian worship? I would have to say not, because God looks at the heart, and some Christian worship is offered cynically by people who love their sin and don't have a repentant heart, and even sometimes people who think it's just magic. They think they can just show up, do a little ceremony, and everything is right between them and God. Well, that's not how it works. So I don't think Christians, that is people in the Christian tradition, always manage to achieve that second sense of worship where they offer something to God and God accepts it. Now, what about Muslims? I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer because God looks on the heart. I would think that it's possible for a Muslim to be truly repentant and to be forgiven, particularly in cases where that person is not explicitly, consciously rejecting the gospel. There are surely many Muslims who have not really heard the gospel and are just dimly aware of really what it all amounts to. Could a person like that worship God in the sense that God finds it acceptable? Well, could a person just going on the basis of natural revelation do it? I think so. What you can't have if you don't have Jesus is the new covenant. You can't have the new deal. You can't be in God's family in that sense. But you can manage to avoid hell without being a Christian, seemingly, because Abraham and Moses and David, we think, did it. That's the standard Christian view. I admit that this last issue is the most difficult and the most controversial, and there's a lot to be said about it, but that's just a really quick first pass. And the thing that's troublesome about this controversy is how many people have just popped off and said, this woman's a disgrace, she should be fired immediately, she should not work at any Christian college, how dare she? People have gotten really furious, and they haven't separated out these four questions, and they think that she's asserting some kind of pluralism, and she's clearly not. Now, there's a whole political and social aspect to this, which I've commented on somewhat in blog posts, and I'm not going to get into it now, but my point right now is this. If you're going to be demanding the firing of some Christian professor at a Christian college, you do need to look into what exactly she's saying and what she's not saying. What she's saying is really not that controversial. The inflammatory things 
like that you can be saved through many different religions or that all religions are the same or that God finds Islamic worship as acceptable as he finds Christian worship. Well, she's just not saying any of those things. So it's a little disturbing how unfair a lot of the commentary has been, especially on social media. Friends, don't forget James. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. When we return to the Trinity's podcast, one of American evangelicalism's most famous commenters weighs in. We've heard briefly the answers to those four questions from me and from Dr. Larisha Hawkins. Now I want to comment a little bit about a widely read, widely disseminated article by Dr. R. Albert Moeller Jr., who's president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He mentions the same God claim, and then he says this, quote, Is this true? The answer to that question depends upon a distinctly Christian and clearly biblical answer to yet another question, can anyone truly worship the Father while rejecting the Son? End quote. What he's doing then is he's focusing on the worship question in the second sense. Can both Christians and Muslims worship God in a way that God fully accepts? Then he quotes some passages from the New Testament where, to sum up in his words, quote, to deny the Son is to deny the Father. End quote. Now I would just remind us of the context of these claims. The New Testament is written in an era when the majority of the Jewish nation has rejected its Messiah. And in rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting God's grace for them. They were rejecting God's reaching out towards them and doing a new thing. He did his ministry among them. He was crucified and raised from the dead among them. Countless miracles were done by the apostles among them. And Jesus himself pronounced judgment upon them, which came upon them pretty soon after Jesus was raised. Now, I would just say that somebody who belongs to a religion like Islam, which officially rejects the message of Jesus, specifically his being the Son of God, the unique Son of God and the Messiah, who died as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of humanity, that message is explicitly rejected in Islam. But this doesn't mean that anybody who's a member of the Islamic tradition is in the same position as Jesus' Jewish contemporaries who rejected his ministry. That your religion rejects something on paper doesn't always mean that you are rejecting that thing. Dr. Moeller continues, To affirm this truth is not to argue that non-Christians, our Muslim neighbors included, know nothing about God, or to deny that the three major monotheistic religions share some major theological beliefs. End quote. It seems that Dr. Moeller is conceding a positive answer to the reference question. Yes, they are talking about God. Yes, they even know some things about God, such as that God created the heavens and the earth, or that God has sent various prophets. So he's saying that Muslim belief is correct about many things, and they are also talking about God. Then he continues, quote, Yet when we look more closely, even these points of agreement begin to break down. End quote. He mentions that they reject the Trinity, they reject the classical Catholic Christology, where Jesus has two natures, he's the God-man. Well, sure, it's not clear how this is to the point of the Wheaton controversy. Was Dr. Hawkins saying that there is no important difference between the two, or that there's no important theological difference between the two? No, she wasn't saying that. Should we reject naive pluralism? Well, sure. Okay, but this doesn't seem to be controversial, at least not controversial among traditional Christians. To his credit, Dr. Moeller mentions Romans 1 and Acts 17, in which Paul argues that there is knowledge of God, of the one true God, by general revelation, so that people without the benefit of Christian revelation, without knowing about the Trinity or the two natures of Christ, without having any of the Bible, people can know about God. And commenting on Acts 17, quote, But this was not a saving knowledge, and the apostle was brokenhearted when he saw the Athenians at worship. End quote. 
That's right, the Apostle Paul was brokenhearted by the idolatry present all over Athens, and he did not generally think that this knowledge led to people being saved. It's not clear, though, that he thought that no one could possibly be saved just on the basis of general revelation. When he's giving his critique of the Gentiles, of the nations of the earth and their idolatry and rejection of God in Romans 1, it's just a general critique. He's talking in generalities, and it's not clear that there aren't ever going to be any exceptions to those, that there isn't going to be some pious person who truly repents and is found acceptable to God. But about religious diversity and the question of salvation, Dr. Moeller takes what you would call a strong, uncompromising, exclusivist stance. He denies that all religions save people, and he denies that anyone can be saved who is practicing some other religion. He denies that, in his words, quote, salvation can come without a conscious and explicit faith in Christ, end quote. So he's rejecting the kind of inclusivism which has become popular in Catholic circles since Vatican II. He then lodges a criticism of Dr. Francis J. Beckwith. Beckwith had said, quote, Abraham and Moses did not believe that God is a trinity, but St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Billy Graham do. Does that mean that Augustine, Aquinas, and Graham do not worship the same God as Abraham and Moses? Again, of course not. End quote. Moeller complains, quote, But this line of argument evades the entire structure of promise and fulfillment that links the Old Testament and the New Testament. Abraham and Moses could not have defined the doctrine of the Trinity while they were on earth, but they believed that God would be faithful to all of his promises, and those promises were fulfilled only and fulfilled perfectly in Christ. End quote. Seems to me that Dr. Moeller is kind of missing the point here. Beckwith is arguing that just because someone is not a Trinitarian uh, doesn't follow that they're not talking about the one God. Moeller says that Abraham and Moses could not have defined the doctrine of the Trinity while they were on earth, well, that's an understatement of the year. They, <laughs> they couldn't define it. They, they didn't believe it. It never entered their minds. Were they anti-Trinitarian? No, you couldn't be an anti-Trinitarian before the 4th century AD. They were non-Trinitarian. They believed that Yahweh was a god, a single divine self. Did they think that he would fulfill his promises? Well, sure, but how is that really relevant to the point at hand? And the point at hand is that you can refer to a being and be quite mistaken about what that being's qualities or properties are. Towards the end of his piece, Moeller says, Hard times come with hard questions, and our cultural context exerts enormous pressure on Christians to affirm common ground at the expense of theological differences. End quote. Well, that's right. There is a pressure towards just saying friendly things and not rocking the boat. People do take offense at the Christian message and at the particularity of the Christian message. But I'm a little bit annoyed to see this in a commentary on the Wheaton controversy, because there was no denial of theological differences, not even really a minimizing of theological differences. When we come back, the differing perspectives of two well-known evangelical apologists The first apologist we'll hear from is Mr. Nabil Qureshi. Mr. Qureshi was raised as an Ahmadiyya Muslim in a Pakistani-American family and later converted to evangelical Christianity. And in the Trinity's podcast episodes 93 and 94, I gave a lengthy review of his book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It's a good book. It's an interesting book with a compelling story. And he's become a bit of an evangelical celebrity. With all the tensions between Christianity and Islam in this country, of course, people are very interested when someone switches sides to the Christian side. Mr. Qureshi is a graduate student, and he also works as an apologist for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And on the blog there, on December 27th, he wrote a blog post called, Do Muslims and Christians Worship the Same God? One of the first things he does is complain about the commentary of Dr. Miroslav Wolf, who had said, quote, there isn't any theological justification for Hawkins' forced administrative leave. Her suspension is not about theology and orthodoxy. It is about enmity towards Muslims, end quote. Qureshi comments, quote, 
Such dialogue-stifling judgmentalism is shocking from a highly acclaimed Ivy League scholar, but it serves to illustrate the enormous tensions in Christian-Muslim relations during this time. End quote. So he's offended by Wolf's judgment. He doesn't get into the reasons that Wolf gives for it, however. And as I've discussed in several blog posts, this case at Whedon is very strange, because on the face of it, there is no conflict between what she said and the Whedon statement of faith. And yet the school is trying to discipline her and even fire her on the basis that she now disagrees with their statement of faith. But getting into the substance of the disagreement, Qureshi says, quote, I am confident of my position. Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God. But given the complexity of the matter, we all ought to stop demonizing those who disagree with us. I should start by saying this. For years after leaving Islam and accepting Jesus as Lord, I believed that Muslims worshipped the same God as Christians, but that they were simply wrong about what he is like and what he has done. After all, I had been taught as a young Muslim to worship the God who created Adam and Eve, who rescued Noah from the flood, who promised Abraham a vast progeny, who helped Moses escape Egypt, who made the Virgin Mary great with child, who sent Jesus into the world, who helped the disciples overcome, and who is still sovereign today. Is that not the God of the Bible? For that matter, the Quran asserts that the Torah and the Gospel are inspired scripture, and that Jews and Christians are people of the book. The Quran tells Muslims to say to them, quote, Our God and your God is one, and unto him we surrender. End quote. That's Surah 29, verse 46. If the Quran asserts that Muslims worship the same God as Jews and Christians, does that not settle the matter? End quote. So Mr. Qureshi is commenting on the fact that it is a standard Islamic teaching. It's always been a standard Islamic teaching that the God who revealed the Quran to Muhammad is the same God who interacted with Abraham and who sent Moses and Jesus and other prophets. So there is a standard Islamic answer to the reference question, which is, yes, we are referring to the same God. There's also a standard Islamic answer to the question of naive pluralism. No, that is false. There are important differences between Christianity and Islam, in particular theological differences, but also practical differences. About the other two questions, I'm not sure if there is a standard Islamic answer to those. I think Muslims are probably disagreeing with one another at least somewhat about those questions to the extent that they've raised them. Before we go through the rest of Mr. Qureshi's post, I want to switch over to another interesting evangelical commenter. This is Dr. John G. Stackhouse, Jr., who's a professor of theology and culture at Regent College in Vancouver, Canada, and a frequent commenter on current events and various cultural controversies. Always an interesting voice. In a post on his blog from December 16th called Do Muslims and Christians Worship the Same God, he says in part this, Quote, Christian missionaries and missiologists have reported for a very long time that converts from Islam to Christianity routinely testify that they did not change gods, but came to understand the one true God better, and especially to understand Jesus aright as not merely a highly regarded prophet, but as the divine human Lord and Savior. Much like Saul on the road to Damascus, many point out these people undergo tremendous change. That's why it's called conversion rather than merely a theological correction but they do not drop one deity for another. We evangelicals would do well once more to listen to our own missionaries more, and to heed those I call our watch dogmatists perhaps less. We also need to know what we're talking about in a highly charged situation such as this. That's why I've taken the pains to rule out a number of issues that really cannot be at stake here and to focus on what seems to me the only conceptual point at stake whether theological difference about God necessarily means that one is praying to and otherwise giving worshipful service to a different God. End quote. He makes a lot of good observations here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but in brief, he is saying, no, this can't be an assertion of pluralism that this Wheaton professor is saying. Uh, she can't be denying important differences between the traditions. Isn't the reference question the interesting question here? So he's focusing on the same question that many Christian philosophers have focused on in the last couple of months as they thought through this controversy. In a later post called Allah and Yahweh, and Tash and Aslan, he's referring to some work by C.S. Lewis, he says in part this, quote, As for the theological issue at stake, namely, can one be truly worshipping the one true God and yet not acknowledge Jesus as Lord, 
I suggested that the New Testament's valorization of Old Testament saints indicates clearly that yes, one can. Now a few qualifiers. First, not just any sort of worship of any sort of supreme being can count. One is in contact with the one true God only by the prevenient grace of God connecting one with God via the Holy Spirit. Preferring to worship just any God won't do, as the Old Testament takes pains to make clear. Second, one might have a troubled understanding of God and still truly connect with God. As a theology teacher, I have to believe this, or lots of my students are in big trouble. If we are willing to grant that lots of Christians have distorted understandings of God and yet are genuine believers, then I am willing to affirm that people in other monotheistic traditions have distorted understandings of God and yet might still be genuine believers. Then skipping a bit, he says, Missionaries have long reported encountering such people, particularly among Muslims, who worship God, albeit with the deficiencies typical of their culture, and then gladly embrace the gospel as better revelation about the God they are already loving. Third, and following on from these two points, some understandings of the Supreme Being are so wrong, so wicked, that they simply direct worship wildly off target. Such clearly would be the case in the worship of the Canaanite god Moloch, or any other wicked, bloodthirsty deity elsewhere in the world. Such an abominable view of God cannot possibly accommodate, let alone facilitate, worship of the one true God. In sum, if you like that kind of deity, you're not going to like the one true God. End quote. Back now to Mr. Nabil Qureshi. When I reviewed his book, I noted that he reports praying to Allah and receiving answers from Allah to his prayers. And while he's wrestling with this whole question of Jesus and Christianity, and while he's reading the Hadith to learn more about the career of Muhammad, to decide whether Muhammad is really a prophet or not, he is praying the whole time to Allah. And not just in the ritual prayers, but even outside of those. He's crying out to God to help him, to show him the correct way. And then in the book, God answers that prayer. So he seems to think that he hasn't changed gods, as the book title would suggest, but rather that he's come to a better understanding of the one God. So back again to his blog post, quote, If the Quran asserts that Muslims worship the same God as Jews and Christians, does that not settle the matter? For years I thought it did, but I no longer do. End quote. So he says that he's changed positions that he's finally learned something new, that when he was a young, naive believer, before he was fully informed, he thought that Christians and Muslims do worship the same God, and now he disagrees. Okay, what is it he discovered then? Quote, Now I believe that the phrase, Muslims and Christians worship the same God, is only true in a fairly uncontroversial sense. There is one creator whom Muslims and Christians both attempt to worship. Apart from this banal observation, Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God. I do not condemn those who think that they do, but the deeper I delve into the Christian faith, the more I realize that this assertion is not only untrue, but also subverts Christian orthodoxy in favor of Islamic assertions. End quote. This paragraph puzzles me. If I understand him correctly, he's saying yes to the reference question. And he's also saying yes to the worship question if we interpret worship as just what the people are doing. So without saying anything about whether God accepts Islamic worship, in any case, Muslims, he thinks, are directing their worship towards the one God. And so when they talk about Allah, they're talking about God. What I'm baffled about is his statement that this is a banal observation doesn't seem like a banal observation. It seems kind of interesting and maybe important. It would distinguish Islam from many other religions, which are worshiping various Buddhas and other traditional deities. If they're trying to do what we're doing, that's at least interesting. That's certainly a point of contact, a place for the argument or the discussion to get started. I don't see why it's a banal observation at all. Christian philosophers that have focused on the reference question, the majority of them have said yes to it, as he is, as Dr. Moeller is, and as I do, but we don't think it's a banal observation. I guess I do think, in a sense, that it's obviously true. I just don't think it's unimportant. So he's setting that interpretation of the claim that Christians and Muslims worship the same God aside. Sure, yeah, they're referring to the same being, and they're directing their worship towards the same being, sure. Okay, but what important interpretation is left? 
as best I can tell, he has in mind the idea that there are no important theological differences between the two religions. But who thinks that? Most informed people are going to deny that. And that's not a standard Islamic claim. He says that saying we worship the same God, quote, subverts Christian orthodoxy in favor of Islamic assertions. But the Islamic assertions are just what he's granted, that we're talking about the same God that you're talking about, and that we're attempting to worship the same being. That's the standard Islamic position. It's not the standard Islamic position that there are no important theological differences between Islam and Christianity. He continues, Let's start with the obvious. Christians believe Jesus is God, but the Quran is so opposed to this belief that it condemns Jesus worshipers to hell. Surah 5, verse 72. For Christians, Jesus is certainly God, and for Muslims, Jesus is certainly not God. How can it be said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God? This fact alone is enough to settle the matter. End quote. Mr. Qureshi here is speaking in the manner of some contemporary evangelical apologists. His statement is not easy to interpret. What does he mean by Jesus is God? If he's talking about the is of numerical identity, then it's incorrect that Jesus is God for Christians. The official Trinitarian position identifies the one God with the Trinity, not with Jesus alone. Non-Trinitarian Christians identify the one God with the Father, like we see in the New Testament. But maybe he means the claim that Jesus is God to be shorthand for Jesus is fully divine, or divine in the way that you see in the Nicene Creed. Well, this is a matter of dispute, but then it would be true for Trinitarian Christians that Jesus is divine and for Muslims that he's not divine. Does it follow that they're not worshiping the same God? Well, if this is the claim that there are multiple divine persons in God, then Muslims do not believe that and deny it. They do not think there are multiple divine persons within God. If there's a banal claim here, it seems to me that this is it. If saying that Christians and Muslims worship different gods, if that's just a way to paraphrase Trinitarian mainstream Christians believe different things about God than Muslims believe, well, of course they do. But saying that Christians and Muslims don't worship the same God is, I think, a confusing way of putting the point. It would be less confusing to say that Christians and Muslims disagree about God. I gave this example in a blog post. If you think that George Washington once chopped down a cherry tree, and I don't think that ever happened, you could paraphrase this by saying that we're talking about two different George Washingtons. But I think that's misleading. I think it's clearer to say that you and I disagree about George Washington. He also mentions that the Quran explicitly denies that God is a father, explicitly denies the Trinity. And Mr. Qureshi summarizes, quote, The Christian God, both in terms of what he is, triune, and who he is, Father, Son, and Spirit, is not just different from the Muslim God, he is fundamentally incompatible. According to Islam, worshiping the Christian God is not just wrong, it sends you to hell. They are not the same God. End quote. Well, what's fundamentally incompatible are the two theologies. When he says, according to Islam, worshiping the Christian God is not just wrong, it sends you to hell, that's correct if what that means is, according to Islam, worshiping God in the way that Christians do and holding Catholic Christian beliefs, that will send you to hell. But of course, their teaching is that worshiping the Christian God in the correct way will not send you to hell. It seems that in Mr. Qureshi's mind, this is just a clash of wills. It's a clash of emphases. He says, quote, So how can people argue that Muslims and Christians worship the same God? By unduly giving priority to the Islamic assertion that this is the same God. The Quran says that Allah is the God of the Bible, so he must be. The Quran says that Allah is the God of the biblical prophets, so he must be. End quote. So his diagnosis is that people are giving preference to Islamic teaching over Christian teaching. Well, of course, there's no biblical position about whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God in the sense that Islam just wasn't around when the Bible was written. There is, of course, an official Muslim position, which is to say yes to the reference question. But again, I can't see it just as a matter of cultural clash or clash of wills or who's to be given the first place. It doesn't seem to be that. 
The majority Christian view, which Mr. Kreshi agrees with, is that naive pluralism is false, that Christians and Muslims are referring to the same being, and even directing their worship towards the same being. It's not the Quranic or the Islamic position that there are no important theological differences. Of course there are. So, what are we arguing about here? What is this disagreement really about? He says, quote, the similarities between the God of Islam and the God of Christianity are fairly superficial and at times simply semantic, end quote. Well, look, it's not superficial to say that both these gods, so to speak, are omniscient and omnipotent, right? Nothing superficial about that. That's supposed to be an essential attribute or to say that they're eternal or creator. I guess he's responding to Wolf's argument that there is so much overlap here that we should say yes to the reference question. Well, we can say yes to the reference question even while disagreeing about the significance of the overlap or quite exactly what kind of overlap there is. So he's just reacting against that. Wolf is emphasizing the agreement. He's going to emphasize the differences. This is just headbutting. He continues, quote, Wolf's challenge in response is that Christians believe they worship the same God as the Jews, though the Jews do not worship the Trinity. How can Christians accuse Muslims of worshiping a different God without also indicting the Jews of doing the same? That would be inconsistent or hypocritical, end quote. Again, if I understand Mr. Kreshi, he's conceded a yes answer to the reference question. But that's the question that Dr. Wolf is focusing on. So he seems to be thinking that Wolf is just saying there are no important differences or something like that, or just unduly emphasizing the overlap or the agreement between the two theologies. His answer is that Islamic doctrine explicitly rejects the Trinity. It's not just non-Trinitarian, it's anti-Trinitarian. Then he goes out on a bit of a limb. He says, quote, Wolf's assumption that Jews did not worship something like the Trinity is unsubstantiated. Many Jews held their monotheism in tension with a belief in multiple divine persons. End quote. I don't think so. It might depend on what you mean by persons, though. There are divine persons who are human beings and angels in some ancient Jewish literature. There are powers or emanations of God that some ancient Jews believed in. It's not clear that's what he means by persons. He is right in saying that the Jews reacted against Trinitarian developments and started to understand the oneness of God in a way where it should rule out any kind of distinction of persons within God. It is true that that is a AD development within Jewish theology. In the end, Mr. Kreshi defends Wheaton College's decision. He says, Quote, Wheaton made a respectable decision in giving Hawkins time off to consider the implications of her statement. She is allowing Islamic assertions to subvert the importance of essential doctrine. That said, one ought not fault her harshly for the mistake, as these issues are murky. End quote. Well, what's murky is Mr. Qureshi's charge. What does he mean that she's allowing Islamic assertions to subvert the importance of essential doctrine? She explicitly agrees with all the essential doctrine. The essential doctrine according to Wheaton College and according to Mr. Qureshi, I assume. This charge of subversion, of undermining, somehow diminishing, is vague and I think unfair. And if you look at what she's written, I think it's just a misinterpretation of it. And I don't think it really gets to the deep disagreement between Christians and Muslims. It's really not a matter of, we say this is important. No, we say this is important. You can't tell us what's important. It's really not that at all. I'm sure Mr. Qureshi would agree that the fundamental issue is whether Muhammad really is a prophet of the one God that Christians and Muslims are both referring to. It's a clash between Muhammad and Jesus as to who is the last and best revealer of the one God. Our last two perspectives are from blogger Joel L. Watts and from a historical figure whom he discusses.
He has a master's in theological studies and is a biblical scholar, and he blogs at unsettledchristianity.com. He has some interesting comments in a blog post called Christians, Muslims, Heresies, and the Same God. This is from December 29th, 2015. He says that he's not sure what to say about the one God question. He's a Trinitarian, and he thinks that's important, and so they're not the same God if that means that there's no important difference between Trinitarian Christian and Islamic teaching about God. And it seems that he wants to say yes to the reference question, which I think is correct, and no to the question of pluralism. And because he says yes to the reference question, he will probably say yes to the worship question if that just means what we are doing. So he would be saying that Christians and Muslims do direct their worship towards the same one. And then he reaches back to a very interesting Catholic thinker who lived in the 600s and 700s. His name is John of Damascus. He was a Syrian monk and priest who was born and raised in Damascus, Syria, and basically spent his career under Islamic rule as a Christian. Mr. Watt says, well, why don't we take our cue from John of Damascus? What was his response to Islam? His response to Islam, and he gives a long quotation from John of Damascus here, his response is to treat Islam as a Christian heresy, to put it in the same bin as Arianism. After quoting John at length, Mr. Watt says, quote, I guess we have to agree with St. John. We do worship the same God. They just get it wrong. Islam is a Christian heresy, end quote. Well, there's something right about this and there's something wrong. What I think is right about it is saying yes to the reference question. I think all the early Christians responded to Muhammad that they understood that he was claiming to be a prophet sent by their God, not some other God. It's just that they rejected that claim. They did not accept him as a prophet of God. They didn't say, well, you're talking about some other deity, Allah. Well, we don't know about that, but anyway, we worship this other deity, Yahweh. No, they said, we understood that you're claiming to be a prophet of Yahweh, but we disagree. John of Damascus, of course, disagreed. What I think is wrong is understanding Islam as a Christian heresy. John of Damascus supposes that he must have somehow been riffing on Arianism, There's no reason to think that. Of course, in various stages of his career, Muhammad surely talked with various sorts of Christians. He traveled around. His first wife was a merchant. And there are reports in the Hadith of Muhammad and his family interacting with with a Christian monk or priest and different people. But no scholar of religions classifies Islam as a Christian heresy, and for good reason. How do you individuate different religions? How do you decide if a tradition is just a part of another tradition or not? Well, historically, Muhammad did not grow up in a Christian milieu and then kind of branch off, say, in the way that Joseph Smith did in the case of Mormonism. He grew up in a different culture entirely. There was, of course, some influence from Christianity, from Christian sources like the Bible, and probably from conversations with Christian people, but That doesn't make Islam a Christian heresy. I think that the heart of any religion's theology is a diagnosis of what's wrong with the human race, what the fundamental human problem is, and then a suggested cure, a way to positively and permanently fix that problem. And the diagnosis is a little bit different in the case of Islam than in the case of Christianity, and the cure is a lot different. And different exemplars are held up. There are different people held up to imitate. So in the diagnosis and cure, and the examples given of people getting the cure, they really are quite different. They're different historically, but they're different in the very central core of their doctrine. They're also different in the ways that any two very different religions are. The institutions are different. The practices are different. The art is different. So no, Islam is not a Christian heresy. That's just a mistake. I think what John is doing is, this is just kind of the knee-jerk way to argue a theological point, to try to stick them in a heresy box. Well, this just isn't an effective way to respond to a different religion. You certainly could never respond to Buddhism or Hinduism in that way as Christian heresies, and equally well, I don't think you can respond to Islam that way. Old does not mean good. There are some ideas even propounded by interesting, respectable, venerable, historically interesting and important people, which are really wrong-headed. And I suggest that this is one of them. So that then is, I hope, my last comment on this Wheaton College controversy. 
But before we finish, I would add one last point. Let's not forget that there are real people involved here. Let's pray for Dr. Hawkins, that she makes wise decisions, and that she can come to some kind of agreement with Wheaton College. Let's pray for Wheaton College, that God will bless them, that their leadership will make wise decisions in this case. Pray that she will be treated justly and fairly, that there can be some show of Christian unity and love here, and that people can take this opportunity to learn about important things and not just try to advance culture wars, culture wars between Christians and Muslims, culture wars between conservatives and liberals. Today's thinking music has been the track I Dunno by Grapes. There's a link to this track at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Do you enjoy listening to the Trinities podcast? There are four ways you can show us some love in return. First, share the blog post for this episode on whatever social media you use. Second, you can leave us a rating and a brief review in the iTunes store and at Stitcher. For step-by-step directions on how to do this, visit trinities.org slash blog slash review. Third, you can donate to the cause by clicking the orange donate buttons to the right of any blog post. Fourth, you can send us some brief, to-the-point audio feedback for possible incorporation into a future episode. We would love to hear your question or your comment in your voice. The upload link for your audio file is on the blog post for any episode. To sum up, you can share, rate, donate, and talk back. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.